Welcome everyone. As you're settling in, we'll just wait for all the attendees to join us. Um, you've come to a SIPS ANZ webinar and really looking forward to um, hearing from um, our speakers today on shifts in global supply chain post COVID. Uh, this is kindly sponsored by Axis Group International. Really looking forward to today. Please, as always, hop on the chat bar, the chat button just down the bottom of your screen and select all panellists and all attendees and tell us where you're listening from today. Um, we'd love to know where everybody's listening from. We'll commence shortly, but settle back and get ready. We've got uh, someone from Sydney and Melbourne already. I'm sure we can go further afield. There we go, Perth, thank you. And Wellington, we're on the board, <laughs> well done. Terrific, great to have everybody on, on board from across the region. And another person from sunny Melbourne today. And Brisbane's just made the board. Welcome everybody, we're going to get started. Um, this is a SIPS ANZ webinar, Shifts in Global Supply Chains Post-COVID, Revisiting the Strategic Choices and Practical Issues in Global Sourcing. And this is kindly sponsored by Axis Group International. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. They're our traditional custodians in the land of which I present today, and we pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. And for New Zealand listeners, Tinakoko, 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 Katawa. We have a number of registered attendees here today and really looking forward to get listening to our speakers. Um, a little bit about SIPS, for those who don't know us, we're the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. And we're your global professional body for procurement and supply professionals. We're dedicated to promoting best practice and continuous improvement in professional standards and raising awareness of the contribution that procurement and supply management can make to organisations. But before we get started, let's do a bit of Zoom keeping. Um, you're all muted during the presentation. However, as you've already started to use the chat box, please write any comments and share any thoughts that you have and make sure you can select all panellists and all attendees. But if you have any specific questions, please go to the Q&A box and we'll address those directly after our speakers have presented. We've allowed plenty of time for that session, so make sure you start putting your, your questions in um, fairly early and we will get to them. Now, a little bit about today's webinar. Shifts in global supply chains post-COVID, revisiting the strategic choices and practical issues in global sourcing. Worldwide, we've had a turbulent end to 2019. Along with the global pandemic this year, we've seen a significant impact on global supply chains. This has left a trail of new issues, risks and choices for organisations, procurement managers, and teams that manage exposure to international markets in their procurement and supply chains. Looking ahead, it is clear that increased complexity is here to stay. And in today's session, our speakers will unpack key changes in global trade patterns, the associated realignment in supply chains, the new risk landscape and challenges strategic areas to focus on, practical things to get exactly right. And in the process, we'll look into the new markets that matter, emerging supply clusters globally, and the approach and methodologies that are adopted by organisations that succeed in global sourcing. Please let me warmly welcome our speakers today. Kovas van der Voff, our founder and CEO of the Axis Group International. Now, Cobus is usually based in Beijing. Today, he's based in Perth. 
and he's been working in Asia for 25 years. Before founding Axis Group and the Beijing Axis, he was Head of Investment Strategy and Global Market Research for Asia Pacific for Standard Chartered Bank. Prior to that, he was a Senior Strategy Consultant with the Boston Consulting Group in Asia. In his early career, he was an emerging market investment strategist in London, a treasury economist with Standard Merchant Bank in Johannesburg, and an economist with the South African Reserve Bank in Pretoria. He holds an MBA, a Master's of Business in IT, a Bachelor in Commerce with Honours Degree in Finance, in Investments and in Economics. He is an Adjunct Professor at the University of Cape Town Graduate School of Business International Strategy Department, teaching doing business in Asia, in China and Asia. We also warmly welcome Rachel Wu, Managing Director, Asia Access Group. She is responsible for global business development, all client solutions and overall PL. She has an international team of procurement professionals across Asia, Middle East and Africa that supports her in driving the business forward. This team spans analytical, commercial, technical and logistics experts that form a part of high performance teams solving access group global procurement and supply client engagement. Her expertise in, is in global procurement, supply chain procurement, commercial transaction management, international business, complex negotiations, risk and strategic development. She has advised numerous international clients with their cross-border activities over the past 15 years. Rachel is also from Beijing and has lived and worked in Australia, Singapore and the rest of Asia and Africa. She has travelled extensively over the past years and is currently based in Beijing and Shanghai. Actually, currently based in Perth today. Uh, before joining Access Group, she worked in senior roles in management consulting, supply chain and logistics. Rachel holds an MBA and a BA Bachelor of Arts in International Business and Trade. Without further ado, let me hand over to Cobus and Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, thank you very much to SIPS also for allowing us to participate here and share some perspectives. Now, I think we've all seen the change over the last uh, three quarters or so. And perhaps then it's a good time to pause, to take stock, to take a step back and assess what this means for where we are, where we are going. And really um, so much has happened that it's very difficult to, to synthesize this into uh, just a few key points. But I still think it is possible to lift out some really important salient um, themes and trends and takeaways. So that's what I hope to do today and with the support from Rachel, who will take all of the difficult questions. Um, so the focus here is the shifts in global supply chains post COVID, but then also specifically thinking about what it means for uh, strategic choices for procurement uh, professionals and practitioners and also very practical issues. Uh, in terms of thinking about and acting in global procurement and supply. So um, our perspective at Access Group is that we are about global markets connected. And one of our core businesses is indeed a global procurement and supply business, where we have been literally in the arena with our clients supporting and um, working very hard over the last um, uh, three quarters. And we have sourcing hubs in different parts of the world, uh, places like Beijing, Shanghai, Mumbai, uh, Delhi, Bangkok, um, in the Middle East, in South Africa, and, 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 and so on, but also clients worldwide. So we've been really living this uh, on an ongoing basis. And in terms of our integrated sourcing and supply solutions or global procurement services, um, or whether supporting capital projects, we've been really um, uh, in, a, in a very different environment like everyone else and hope to share here from, um, from those experiences. So when we think about global procurement um, and supply, we, we often 
like to think about four key questions. Why would you do global sourcing or global procurement? Where would you go? What categories or products would you typically focus on more as opposed to say going local? And then of course, how? And really so across that spectrum of, of make versus buy decisions, um, global sourcing models, the countries, the, the potential suppliers and the ultimate engagement models. That's the framework. So that's how we've kind of approached this session as well. So the structure is to very quickly remind ourselves of some of the key shifts that are taking place. And there are some fundamental shifts in trade patterns and global supply chains across different regions and different industries. Then move on to just sketching quickly the, ri the risk context and the upshot for challenges for, uh, for the profession. And then um, moving on to thinking from a top management and senior management perspective, what are some of the imperatives, but then bringing it back down to day-to-day -day activity, implementation level, uh, operational level, considerations for getting global procurement right, and then a few final uh, comments. And Rachel will support as I go along and also be very active in the Q&A. So just uh, uh, to start, we've obviously seen over the last number of years an ongoing change in the who are the top exporters. So as a procurement manager, the countries that you would go to, they've been re-ranking and they've been very um, uh, dynamic. Uh, China came from number 19 in 1990 to number one around about 2010 and has been consistently at the top. Um, Mexico was at number 20 and has come up to number 10 last year. Um, countries like um, Malaysia have fallen just slightly off that top 20 list, but countries like India have newly emerged um, and places like Vietnam, for example. And all within that uh, spectrum, of top exporters, we've seen significant losers and significant winners. So that's at a global level. But also, just if we take the big change of the last two, three decades, where we had um, in 19, say, 98, uh, the US very dominant as typically a, a leading trade partner for most developed and developing economies, we've ended up by 2018 with China was typically for most players, most countries, the, the, the number one trade partner, and that could be in exports and imports. So this has been a, 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 a big shift, um, a big backdrop change. Um, and for Australia more specifically, we've also then seen as this unfolded, all this global re-ranking and China stepping onto the world stage happened, how Australia's import origin countries changed, 1990, 95, 2005, 10, and 15, and of course, uh, more recently. And China has also, as one would, would know and expect, been at the top. But it's very interesting that we've seen um, newly Mexico enter the, the picture, and we've seen certainly within that spectrum some re-ranking. Vietnam has also come from a lower position, not even appearing on the list in 1990. Um, and then, uh, you know, a few other countries, India uh, as well, has, uh, has become uh, more of a, a featuring exporting country for Australia. So what we are saying here is that just, you know, over the long term, we've seen some dynamics, we've seen some change, and there's been a, a shift in um, which um, uh, countries uh, Australia imports from. So if we take the global 30 exporters, you can see that we even now have countries like Poland there at number 22. Um, and if you look at the growth rates of some of these countries, um, you know, at 5% China over 10 years, um, Hong Kong, which is a conduit for different Asian uh, uh, markets, supply hubs, 3%. Three, uh, 3%. If you look at Mexico, over 5% KGAR, uh, India, close to 5% KGAR, um, and Vietnam, almost 16%. Poland, almost 6%, then clearly there is a re-ranking taking place. And in Australia's case, if one looks at the import uh, origin countries, you can also see the growth rates. Um, you can see the green ones and the stars are the high growth, positive growth countries. And the red ones are the negative uh, growth countries. So it's implicit in this, very much and explicit, 
you can add that there is a re-ranking. So which companies, which industries, which parts of value chains are the progressive ones getting it right? Of course, there would be an underlying wish and urge to go local, especially given some of the risks that were uncovered during uh, PPE um, and, and, and COVID related uh, sourcing over the last um, nine months. But Australia is not going to have the industrial base that everyone would want it to have overnight or even in the medium term, let's hope in the longer term. But it does mean global trade is a reality and this is the re-ranking that has been taking place. So what we see is that going forward, if one takes just very quickly, the top 100 global imports of Australia, a lot of detail, don't worry too much about the detail, but simply to say that machinery and electronics, transportation, textiles and chemicals are gonna be in the nine broad categories, the ones that will see more shift um, in terms of countries that Australia imports from. Now, if you are sitting in a business where you're not planning to change anything, then you're kind of bucking the trend a little bit. And that's the point we're trying to make because, uh, because of rising costs in places like China and because of um, you know, newly invested infrastructure in places like India and elsewhere in Southeast Asia and perhaps in Poland and Turkey and even further afield in Mexico, there will be a re-ranking. And this means uh, on the back of COVID that we are going to potentially see this accelerate. So if we just then dive a little bit more deeply into Australia's imports, if we take the top five countries that um, Australia imports from, number one, China, number two, the US, three, Japan, four, um, Thailand, and five, Germany, and you take the top 10 imports, you can see the green and the red, the growth rates over 10 years, dramatic. And that shall, tells us how dynamic this is. Now, who has the strategic intelligence in their teams to be able to watch this, to dashboard this, to preempt, to anticipate, to know whether it should be China versus India or India versus Southeast Asia, or whether to look at Eastern Europe? And where does local sourcing now, reshoring um, or nearshoring or onshoring, where does that fit within your planning? So it's a very complex puzzle, uh, but what we can say is it's very dynamic. And to prove the point, in the third quarter, we saw that year-on-year -year growth for the top exporters looked like this. You basically had four countries with positive export growth. Vietnam, number one, China, Taiwan, and Turkey. And then small negatives to very big negatives. Now, this, of course, was as a result of uh, BCPs and uh, logistics bottlenecks um, and the crisis impact of COVID. But some of this will persist in the sense that there are new winners and losers. And if someone had in the past, the top four suppliers say in China or in uh, Thailand or in India, they now thinking differently, typically, you know, where to go, how to diversify, what can be brought back on shore um, and what cannot and how to diversify that. So that's the backdrop uh, of shifts that we are seeing unfold for some time already, but also more recently. How does the risk context then look at this point in time? So at the end of last year, we had a particular risk history. There was a US-China trade war with ripple effects all around the world. For everyone, there was the prospect of a, of a US election, which we currently painfully still living through. Um, and some geopolitical tensions here and there, technological uh, shifts, um, AI, machine learning, uh, digitalization, and of course, environmental challenges. Then with 2020, COVID unfolded, first the health crisis, then some you know, first order, second order effects in supply chains. And then of course, unemployment, um, bailouts you know, at a national and international scale, causing budget deficits, um, lower growth, uh, shutdowns in factories, um, shipping, uh, exports and deep really impact economically. And then even some geopolitical quakes as, uh, as one would have expected all along. And where we are now towards the end of 2020, we're really going into the next phase where we still have all of those risks. None of them have fallen by the wayside. We're basically just seeing an accumulation and now an amalgamation of risks 
And it really means that it's a, it's a piece of string that's getting stretched. Some companies will not make it, will not uh, survive. Some will correct. Some industries have been decimated and will not recover for years to come. Some have actually accelerated and moved ahead. Um, and if, uh, if we are in inbound supply chain management, uh, procurement and supply management, knowing what our suppliers uh, are going to live through and their suppliers has never been more difficult or more important. And that is the risk context that, that we are sitting in. Further out, we even expecting deeper tectonic shifts, things that have been happening now in terms of mindsets, the way we think, the way we consume, the way we do things, the way we live, the way we work. And um, that implies not just that we have a new normal now, but probably a new normal too, that we cannot even possibly predict. Um, and some localization, still some offshoring, reshoring, nearshoring, onshoring. This is a very turbulent environment through which uh, to work. And what it then means is that the organizational thought process must adapt, fundamentally, irreversibly adapt and we must take key lessons and shape new thinking. So clearly some key lessons that we must bear in mind is that black swans do exist. Um, it's often seen as something hypothetical or theoretical or academic, but no, they do exist. And in supply chain, we need to plan for that. We need to get the basics exactly right. When things go wrong, we cannot start to learn and say, what is the 101 or the ABC of getting this right or BCPs? The basics must be sorted so that we can work on the higher value added elements. The interconnectedness of things cannot be overemphasized. We need to make sure that through all the ranks of the organization and all regions and businesses, we understand internally, but also externally, uh, how interconnected things are, and even between different countries and regions and industries and upstream and downstream uh, value chains. And of course, it means that we need to make sure that we have holistic thinking and a holistic view, because we cannot have blind spots. Um, and in a way, we all just living through all of this, we need to go back and rethink what habits do we have? What orthodoxies do we hold that are no longer valid, that we just assume without even realizing that? And that the thinking that needs to shift is around this dictum of preempting and anticipating um, and thinking global and thinking globally. And then visibility in a supply chain where you might have 10 or 20 countries in your global sourcing program, and you have to have visibility in all of that every container, every contract, every shipment. And that is not easy. That is indeed a tall order, but that is exactly what we're asking. That is the new thinking that we need to adopt. And the idea of mitigating cost and it being too, um, mitigating risk and it being too expensive and therefore we don't mitigate. We just hope that this is a black swan that will never happen. That needs to be really carefully uh, assessed and reassessed and the old classical, risk matrix of probability and impact now needs to be front and center for everyone to truly understand, given what we've seen recently, what is really our risk profile and what are our plans for when things start to happen. And all of this cannot be rule-based or a tick box where we follow a certain set of instructions. We need to work at the organizational culture level because that is really, I think, the only way that we can um, overcome. And then if we move from, from that to some strategic uh, perspectives, um, what does this mean for top management, for senior management, for us as practitioners, but even more across the organization? Um, uh, uh, certainly clearly the, the for, for, for myself, and this is something that Rachel and I have often talked about, um, global procurement and supply, and just, I think, procurement generally, needs to now be elevated to the top table more than ever. Now, I've been to so many SIPs conferences where this has been said in a closed room, uh, and we all agree on it, but it doesn't necessarily uh, happen, and it doesn't necessarily roll out uh, the day or two after the conference. But clearly, we must use this opportunity as, as a profession to work differently, 
to do a different type of sales job. In another three or six months after stability returns, people will forget. And we must make sure that they never forget. We must absolutely ensure that that risk matrix is in the mind of the CEO, in the mind of the top team, and that we have a voice and, and a place at the top table. So this clearly is a must. Uh, it is true, I think, for all kinds of procurement, uh, local procurement, services procurement, and across the spectrum, but certainly when you're connected to places around the world that you cannot even visit, and where you have uh, second, third, fourth tier suppliers that you don't have visibility on, this becomes crucial. The second point is just the information aspect. The quality and speed of information becomes really a differentiator between successful outcomes and uh, questionable outcomes or, or uncertainty on, 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 on outcomes. So having a risk radar that picks up the right signals, processes that, and communicates that at speed and good quality information to support decision making real time becomes absolutely strategic. And then just back to this idea of a supply based uh, portfolio, whether local procurement close by multi country or uh, you know, China plus one or plus two or low cost country or global procurement, uh, you know, to the full extent, this becomes a really important point for analysis, for, for, for decisions and an area in which to now continue some work. Even if markets stabilize, we go through the next phase from a BCP phase to a normal phase, we need to rethink what means, uh, what, 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 what does it mean to say we have a truly sustainable uh, supply chain with the right portfolio of suppliers in it. And then I think, um, you know, even sitting here talking on Zoom, the way that we use technology, uh, blockchain, um, AI, um, in procurement and supply, but just across all industries and regions and businesses, and the interface with people. Um, often we hear people talk about technology if it's something remote or something uh, external but it isn't, it is all intertwined and that getting that mix right and getting everyone comfortable and to adopt uh, and, to, and to internalize and to diffuse in their areas, the, the use uh, and, and leveraging the power of technology becomes extremely important, important. And what we've clearly also learned is partnerships because no one can do everything. We need to partner well for when we need those partners and that can give us global reach because we cannot be insular and insulated Ever again, we live in a global world, despite global shocks and adjustments and realignment of supply chains, we still need global reach and partnerships and, and other means, but certainly partnerships become a very important um, lever for, for driving that. Rachel, I've gone so much. Did you want to add anything? Please uh, jump in. Sure, thank you, Kovas. Maybe just go, going back to the first point, um, it's actually very interesting to see that in the past months, we have been having procurement conversations with global procurement teams from client size and also with group CEO or group CPO involved is, um, is perhaps a sign that the strategic importance of procurement within an organization has been increasing. And you know, as procurement practitioners, um, we have to continue this and then ensure that procurement plays a bigger and more important role, which is strategic for your supply chain and procurement, either local or global. Yes, yeah, so I think Rachel makes a good point that, you know, our organization is 20 years old and I can not count that many instances where a, where a, a group CEO of say a company with a market cap of more than $30 billion joined a call with, that we were having operationally with our client CPO. This happened multiple times over the last six or nine months. So CEOs, COOs, CFOs were pulled in to the day job of CPOs. How do we keep some of that? How do we le leverage some of that? Because clearly when this crisis dissipates and fades away, memories will go with that too. Um, and, we, and we should not allow that. So, so that is indeed uh, an important point. On, on some practical considerations, uh, you know, I think that's more the world that we all live in day by day. Um, what we want to lift out is just six key points. Firstly, 
the relationship with suppliers and engagement from A to Z where suppliers must go to the next level. Um, I can cite so many examples where we were called in the last few months with people asking us to call their suppliers in faraway countries and ask them questions that they should have on the desk, right available, right there. Um, which means that it was a detached, there was no visibility, there was a, it will be fine mindset. So that engagement needs to be best practice. The fact that it's far away, that it is remote, that it is a different language, a different con a culture, a different type of contract, um, a different time zone, uh, and I cannot visit, I cannot communicate, does not mean we can, um, you know, uh, not have that deep engagement. So we need to work towards that. The second one is uh, logistics and supply chain as a, as a whole comprehensive chain needs to be optimized. In the last few months, we had to charter airplanes for emergency um, deliveries. Um, this is not something that we've done a lot over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. but, but this literally having the inability to move critical supplies um, at, at, at you know, absolutely huge cost. Um, and um, in some cases, I must admit that the clients were not, were not set up. Um, they brought it onto themselves. So having that optimized uh, all weather ready um, integrated chain, again, it's a tall order, but for that we need top management support. We need the best people, we need the budgets, we need the team um, in a strategy. Um, so a lot of things uh, flow from what we are saying here, but that is exactly what we are saying is necessary. And then just the end-to-end -end supply chain visibility uh, one more time, having dashboards, having control towers, having digital, um, you know, uh, tools that can track and trace and give absolutely clear visibility. Um, and then, of course, we all learned this one big lesson, what is the right level of uh, inventory? Um, what is the impact on balance sheet if you have more inventory? CFO will give you a call and say, you know, this doesn't look good. But if you have a black swan event, then that might have been an inexpensive investment. So this is, this is a, a, an area that really, I think, will see a lot of thinking, a lot of research, a lot of debate going forward. And I think for different organizations, they all need to make sure that they understand this better and manage this optimally. And then I think um, the, the idea that we can um, have a resilient, an, an agile and strong and adaptable, flexible um, inbound supply chain, but it costs money. Uh, so therefore we, we, we compromise. Um, so this interplay or the, or the um, trade-off between cost and resilience is something to get exactly right. And it, it may not be that across your entire spend, you have the same rules, the same decision-making or the same approach, but you need to be able to understand lead times, criticality, uh, what, you know, supply and demand disequilibriums may set in in the event of a crisis, uh, you know, whichever crisis or form of crisis that might, might be. And then making sure that we are at least resilient in those areas and maybe pay some money away towards that. So generalization no longer uh, possible. We need to be very specific. And then a final point here on the um, sustainable sourcing and we're thinking here of modern slavery we're thinking of just broadly corporate social responsibility safety health a lot of corners have been cut recently on contract terms on um, you know and they're just getting the job done because we're in a crisis and we should not lose sight of the fact that we do need to adhere to certain minimum standards and principles um, and specifically on sustainability, um, not cut corners because there's a new crisis. Two, two mistakes don't make one right. So um, this I think is a very important point as well. And then we wrapping, getting towards the end to, to start to wrap up, but just to go a little bit deeper into this idea of the practical considerations, what we have seen with our client base is that they generally have things working when a crisis comes, generally things continue, but there are flashpoints. They have, call it a pain point or something unexpected that pops out as something they cannot really easily deal with. What is that area for you? 
what does it mean to say you need to do the right things right? So obviously, firstly, you need to determine what the right things are, and then how do you execute? But if you take the chain of activity from upstream thinking, you know, which markets will we go to, to clusters, to specific countries, to supplier analysis, identification analysis, engagement, and then ultimately maybe call it the logistics management and final deliveries. There are all these pockets of areas where you need to show excellence. Analytics, global category strategy, um, the people, languages, for example, um, and uh, you know, ability to negotiate multiple contracts over multiple cultures and regions and time zones in different languages at speed. Um, partnering, um, understanding when a fast moving environment, what if you start to pay higher prices because of supply and demand disequilibrium, um, what is the total cost of ownership impact? And then just really, when everyone is starting to run BCPs, work from home, you can't call them, you don't have a mobile phone, um, how do you do supplier relationship manager for countries you know, that are far away around the uh, globe? and contract management, supplier performance management, so even deeper, higher order objectives like true supplier development. If you're thinking of long-term relationships, how to, how to continue to do that during times of COVID and quality management. So we've had a lot of, of clients come to us and say, listen, we cannot do inspections. We cannot do modern slavery orders. We cannot travel to China or to Bangladesh or to India or to Thailand. Um, and so planning for, for these uh, types of situations where you cannot do um, inspection work or quality assurance, quality control work, or on the ground consolidation work, deconsolidation work, um, and of course, international freight management and just the integrated supply chain. So what is it that you need to understand to have green lights, amber lights, and red lights, uh, red lights and understanding your dashboard at, at all um, different times? Rachel, do you want to? Yes, I just uh, want to quickly cover three points. The analytical side, the supply performance management, and also the freight management. Um, every business is currently under pressure for cost reduction, but we do not need to, um, um, by changing suppliers, uh, be exposed to the risk of quality or to jeopardize quality and also be exposed to the risk of um, ethical procurement. Um, some investment at the initial phase of strategic sourcing by uh, analytical work can actually help us to do it in a smart way. We can reallocate a part of your supply or a part of your supply chain into different areas. Um, so analytical work in our view is very helpful very helpful at the current environment. Quickly move to supplier performance management. For most supplier bases and most industries, in the past months, we have seen consolidation within the uh, previous supplier base. Therefore, if we have not done a rescan of your supply, um, uh, your supply pool, tier one, tier two, and tier three, maybe it's not, uh, maybe it's not time to do a health check to see whether there is any hidden uh, risks in your supply chain that has not been searched to the surface, but may or may not um, in the future, and then plan um, uh, alternative supplier and add them into your supplier pool for supplier development. And lastly, freight management. We all know that uh, now um, with uh, some countries coming out of COVID, Orders are pouring into best cost countries, for example, um, selected countries in Asia. And uh, for example, in China, we now have seen that logistics capacity, either inland, international, are under severe pr pressure. Not only shipping lines are running out of capacity, especially now in this traditional peak season, also containers are booked out. Uh, we even tried to purchase containers for our clients, but the manufacturers in China for containers are all at full capacity until quarter two next year. And even secondhand containers are fully booked out. So how you have 
formed your relationship with the logistics service providers or you are ad hoc uh, client for them and only go to them when there is an issue or there, there has been a strategic relationship formed and would prioritize their capacity for you under this turbulence is perhaps a topic that one needs to look into. Um, so it is a busy slide with a lot of elements to consider. It will be different for different businesses, but um, hopefully that what we have shared can be helpful. Thank you, Rachel. So yeah, we are really saying you have to be superman and superwoman. Um, you need to do the advanced analytics, supplier relationships, performance development, the, the global category knowledge, um, the portfolio, the total cost analysis, uh, the contract management, uh, the risk management, all of this with multiple suppliers, multiple parts of the world, real time for every container, every contract, every shipment. That is exactly it. And you can't leave it to chance um, that, that things will not, not go wrong. We need to build systems that can actually cater for the variability that will inevitably come at some point. And the final two points are so super crucial. We need to sit in the boardroom. We need to sit at the top table to make these changes, to make them last, to make them endure as professionals um, in, in, in the field of, of procurement. Um, we must maintain that voice, keep that voice, even as the crisis dissipates. And skills in our teams, uh, uh, they've never been more important. Bringing the right people in, making this career uh, an exciting career so that we can attract the smartest uh, out there, uh, the most dynamic, most energized people, showing them that they can make an impact that really transcends the entire business. And that is not just simply a, a small modest task at your desk, but procurement actually is something integral in, in so much of the business. And then uh, very quickly, a few final uh, comments. So what we've said here is that the world of supply chains are realigning or is realigning. Trade patterns are adjusting, costs are changing, relative costs, competition, new countries are emerging as winners, some are falling off the table. Geopolitics, of course, is becoming uh, heated. Um, COVID has created a, an entire new paradigm in which we need to function. And we still have the, the, the hope and, and the need to try and do more local procurement, but we are part of a global village. Turmoil, dynamism, complex, and we need to make that um, uh, the, the landscape that we operate in. It's not gonna get easier. It's not gonna get better. It means more risk, and it means we need to be better at risk management. That is it. We simply need to be at the top of our games in managing this complex, um, fast-changing environment for successful outcomes. And in doing so, the most crucial is leadership at the top of the organization, but also in our teams in procurement and supply, we need to be strong leaders. We need to bring our own teams with us. We need to bring change in the organization and even outside of our organizations. This does not happen by itself. This does not happen easily. Even with the best efforts may be hard or impossible, but leadership is the single most important. And then of course, using levers such as uh, quick, fast quality information, getting technology and digital and the interfaces with people and teams right, the supplier mix and partnering really, really well and early so that these partnerships are there when they are needed. And then finally, as one gets into the practical day-to-day, uh, -day, we need to know what the right things are that we need to do right. And this will be different at different times for all organizations, but we should have those dashboards in place so that we can actually implement, not plan, but implement. So with that, I'd like to uh, wrap up and just say that I'm not gonna cover the next section, Oh, Rachel will also not comment on this, but just to point out that in our appendix, we have some mind maps about where, why, what, and how to source globally that can help frame some thinking. Um, we get asked about this quite a lot. Then we also introduce some information on economic production and export clusters around Asia, um, different countries, typical packages and categories that we see as dynamic for, for competitive exports. 
but also globally in places like Mexico, Poland, Turkey, South Africa, and Brazil. Perhaps for some in the audience, this could be interesting reading afterwards. And then we also present for different levels of technology and capital complexity um, in developed and developing countries in the short to medium term, how are different um, uh, countries and industry clusters competing and what opportunities does that present for procurement managers to see the world as a landscape where you can play based on the relative merits. And then finally, China is of course a very dominant force though in global supply chains, just to create a framework for what would be some of the drivers that can support or undermine China's manufacturing competitiveness. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And um, Rachel, I'm sure you would like to also say thank you. Yes. And um, very happy to take some questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Rachel and Cobus. And yes, there are plenty of questions. Um, I understand that you will be sharing these slides um, after the presentation as well. Fantastic. Um, also, just to, we are, we want to ensure that we're fully accessible to everyone. So for those members um, of the audience who would like to verbally ask a question, we just ask that you raise your hand in the reaction bar and, um, and Sophia will get to that. So those are the people who uh, are not comfortable writing um, questions but would like to ask a question. Thank you. Let's get started. Um, Knut asks, if you were a Norwegian salmon producer selling fresh salmon to the Asian market, the fish is slaughtered at day one and expected to be on the table in Asia the day after, what would be the things you should be planning for now, start implementing to prepare for normal 2.0? Thanks, Knut. Just the mute bar, Cobus. Yeah, this is an interesting question. We actually, you know, global procurement and supplies is a core business, but we have a market expansion business where we import and distribute products into China um, and a few Asian countries. So this is a question that we've been facing uh, where you need to have a cold chain that works even if there are fewer flights um, and much less availability on those flights. So I would, I would say that the key issue is to manage the, the channels to the different segments in the marketplace very strategically, very closely, and then partners, for example, um, supply chain and logistics service providers that would be able to support you getting space on those cold chain um, logistic solutions that you would need. This is very, very um, complicated to do but um, we actually have, um, you know, been quite successful over the last few months by just working in the trenches, making sure that you get um, the right service partners around you, that you maybe refocus your customer base on fewer points. Let's say it's China, for example, um, and make that work, make that succeed. But this is a this is a very very um, good question. There's no one all solving answer, but I think a professional team now would be engaging very closely with their customers and reinventing, resetting that engagement and the solution providers that service the fulfillment into those uh, segments. And I think I think that that is a, a significant. Um, uh, component of the overall problem. The question then is, do you have people on the ground? Do you speak, say, the local language? Do you have pre-qualified service partners already? Or can you quickly move and do that now? Um, and knowing enough market intelligence to know which markets are going to be most acutely affected and maybe veering away from that and timing which markets you target. You know, sometimes products like these are seasonal um, and understanding those seasonal cycles and then, you know, other cycles on the calendar in your markets that you serve and knowing, you know, what are sometimes just impossible to achieve and what is maybe the areas in which it's more possible to achieve. So I, I must say, Nud, be happy to engage with you offline on this topic. This is a very interesting, deep question. Terrific, thank you. And um, Shri asks, will countries be moving towards insourcing post-COVID? 
Um, uh, we see that people want to do it, but what does that mean? It, 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 it kind of assumes that you have the alternative available. The alternative may be that you need a huge capital investment in say furnaces, um, casting uh, technology, if you're in the metallurgical industry, or it could mean that you have um, very stable electricity if you're in the wafer fab industry. Most countries don't have either of these two things. So you are constrained. You also cannot build these overnight. To build a power plant can take years in some countries. Um, and you know they could just not be the available capital. So of course, I think wherever possible, people will start to get closer to home, try to create visibility in the supply chain that way. Inevitably, they'll also make some mistakes in the process and start buying locally from traders that buy globally and, and, and have a fake sense of security and visibility. So please avoid that mistake. I think it is about doing a, a spend analysis and a strategic analysis and saying what is viable to bring closer to home, to do ourselves, to, to build ourselves, to make ourselves in, internally or to buy across the street in our local market or maybe from another state. But inevitably, a very sizable chunk of that spend will be imports and then facing up to that and building a system with all the right you know, components to it that can service that well and solve that well. But I think the underlying, yes, everyone has been burned. Uh, people are ex feel exposed. They've seen the fragility of, of international supply chains, or in fact, of all supply chains. And that instinct is to make it simple and make it safe. But the world is already so globalized uh, with $19 trillion of, of global exports. You know, we're not going to see that shrink to nothing. If you're looking at Australia with $221 billion of imports, that's not going to be substituted by domestic production. So, yeah, I think that's what we can say. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Um, another question. As I read today's papers, COVID has driven retailers to cancel orders, delay or cancel payments and demand further discount on goods from overseas manufacturers. Do you think this will continue as retailers try to recover? Yes, I think all organizations as nations act with self-interest. So this, this must seem like the, the easiest path forward. You could challenge that. Is it fair? Does fairness matter? Is it just? Uh, does justness matter? Is it ethical? Is it legal? Um, and um, but it may still be necessary for survival. But you are dealing with a supply base that you may need tomorrow that is also confronted with certain realities. And I think all I can say here is that, yes, I, we've seen this everywhere in all our client bases in, in Africa, South America, North America, in Australia, um, because people are under so much pressure. But as things get better and there's a revival you also realize that people share that they felt very bad doing that and they wish they didn't have to, or they had another choice. So what if you could delay that? What if you could find another model, another configuration to share some of the burden with truly strategic suppliers? Um, you know, and, and just seeing that once you cut costs to the bone in developing countries that you rely on, you are potentially forcing them to cut their contracts, their over, overtime pay, their social contracts with the community around them, which could give rise to more increases in modern slavery. Now, that's not to say that, you know, um, I'm, I'm saying you, you just need to overpay and honor all contracts and because you might spark modern slavery somewhere. You know, the world is not that simple. The world is very complicated. And I think this is where, you know, gray hair or no hair, good judgment, good experience, stable hands, senior management, top management need to guide and coach and mentor people that have seen difficulties, people that have seen recessions, depressions, or that have at least read about them if, if, if everyone is too young, um, can come in and not react to the instinct or the impulse. Because in some cases, inevitably, those might be the wrong reactions. So I'm sorry, I'm adding to the question. I'm not really answering no. it. No, no, it's good. 
Sharon, yeah, I yeah, do right. not think it's a one size story. I think before what happened from the buying side, from the supplier base, there were also very severe interruption in production. And we have seen many manufacturers issuing certificates from the government just to simply inform their clients that because of the pandemic, we, we were not able to supply or we were not able to supply on time. So this um, uh, canceling order delaying payment actually came after that. So um, it's perhaps more uh, mutual support from both parties. Uh, what is more interesting is currently we we are seeing pouring order into um, some Asian countries that uh, does increase the shifts and uh, demand. And uh, we have seen that now manufacturers are struggling to keep up or catch up the deadline to supply again. So um, either way, either the positive or negative, either the inbound or outbound um, support from both parties are required to survive together. Terrific. And, and I suppose from, from the professional body's perspective, we would want to see the, the right people with the right capabilities, regardless if they've got no hair or grey hair, uh, to be trained in um, supplier uh, management relationship to really, you know, identify how you can work together. So that's, that's terrific. Thank you. Another question um, from Sarah. How will the current difficulties between China and Australia affect the ability of Australian companies to source from China? Do you think trade will shift to countries such as Vietnam? Thanks, Sarah, for asking a very uh, you know, easy question. <laughs> um, I think this is a, a, a very big challenge. Um, at a purely political level, there is a lot of uh, tension, clearly. But at the everyday level, businesses, I think, will continue to do business. And if you look at the on merits, the China as a part of integrated global supply chains, I think will continue to feature very dominantly and even, or at least prominently in, in supply chains, including here in Australia. At the same time though, there has already been a shift, as I indicated earlier on, to, to for some changes in the top countries. Does this mean China may become number two or three in the import uh, source? Not necessarily in the short term, I suspect. But uh, I think the, 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 the share of lower down countries probably will benefit, but they would have benefited anyway. But I think to just to, to not shy away from answering, I think, yes, at the moment, if you look at the media, if you look at the headlines, clearly it's hardly um, uh, encouraging to see what we see. So I think there is already, um, with COVID as well, uh, a drive towards having just, I think, a more sustainable and, and a less fragile a less exposed um, supply base. And so many of us have seen people put top one, top two, top three suppliers all in China or another country for that matter. That I think will, will be a shift. So I think people will be very selective and stay with China in cases where it makes good sense, but at the same time, actively diversify in case things deteriorate that they not you know, caught um, flat footed. I think we've got time for just one quick question here. And Ben Gill asks, global sea freight is hugely disrupted at the moment. And as you mentioned, shipping containers are scarce in some markets. Do you know where all the containers have gone? And when do you expect shipping, particularly in the Asia Pacific region to return to normality? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, um, because of the current pouring orders into best cost countries, especially in Asia and in China. Um, and then, of course, the containers have gone to the traditional um, uh, export destinations of China and Asia, for example, in Europe and also very much in, in North America. And because we perhaps do not currently at the moment have enough products coming back to China and Asia from those destinations. So that is one course for um, uh, containers uh, currently stuck in Europe and North America. And the other important reason is that ports and sea freights actually are still a relatively higher risk uh, um, area or element in supply chain uh, to COVID-19. And therefore, lack of uh, proper um, uh, resources on site to handle the process and also more strict uh, procedure of testing, checking, um, 
import or at customs, perhaps is another reason why it has been so, so much delayed and prolonged. And shipping companies are doing everything they can to uh, try to collect those containers back, but it will take time. So we do foresee that it will continue and perhaps will even um, uh, be deteriorating during the Christmas and January um, or early February China New Year time. Uh, but uh, from quarter two, it perhaps hopefully can be normalized. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Cobus, for such an informative um, seminar and also for all the rich information that you've provided as well. And um, thank you kindly. It's This has been kindly sponsored by Axis Group International, so that's um, been a terrific session. Um, and we look forward to inviting our audiences back to some more terrific sem seminars and webinars. Um, we've got one next week on the 2nd of December. It's our Women Leaders in Procurement and Supply. This has been a four part series and we're holding the final one for this year. And in this webinar, we will um, have a theme of wisdom and courage. And I'm really looking forward to interviewing Marley Smith from ASC, Cindy Dunham from Orica, a fellow from Orica, and Sarah Cotgreave, uh, a fellow who is a consultant. Then also next week on the 3rd of December, we'll be doing looking at the Modern Slavery Act and key compliance trends and next steps. So that's um, a workshop webinar in collaboration with the Australian Border Force team and Informed 365. So that'll be a terrific one. So for more information on those uh, webinars and all of SIPS Australia and New Zealand's information, go to our website at sips.org or go to our LinkedIn page. And please, I ask before you leave today, please do our post webinar, post event webinar. It's um, a great way for us to build and do better next time. But to Rachel and Cobus, thanks again, um, a great session. And um, also thank you to our sponsor, Axis Group International. Until then, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.